My dear brothers and sisters, it's really good to be with you around the Word of God this afternoon. The character of our Heavenly Father and His ways and His might and His name, these things are revealed to us in many ways in the Word of God. Perhaps one of the most powerful being the way in which He deals with His children, both natural and spiritual Israel. For we know that like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And our father, Israel's father, Israel's God, will bring salvation to that people, but only after they have suffered very much. Only after many who are now in the land have been killed, that a remnant might survive as the basis of the nation in the age to come. And yet his love and his power and his purpose will indeed be manifested in his people that the nations of this world might see his hand at work and wonder. The people of our God, brethren and sisters, were never promised a time of ease, a life of comfort. For we know that the way to the kingdom will be narrow. We know that the path will often be very difficult that we must climb. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And this principle is true for natural Israel also. Through much tribulation, they will be brought to Jerusalem, brought to acknowledge their king, brought to love and worship their God. The history of this people is, of course, more incredible and more unlikely and more varied than any other. On top of this, the history of Israel has often gone through cycles, hasn't it? We only need to read the book of Judges to see that. How many times have God's people entered the land only to leave it again, often in very unpleasant circumstances? I counted five. They entered, of course, under Abraham. They departed into Egypt under Jacob. They entered under Joshua in Joshua chapter 3. They departed some into Assyria and some into Babylon. We're going to come back to this slide in a few moments. Here we have this particular find which is now on display in the British Museum depicting Tiglath-Pileser's army carrying away captives from Israel. Again, the Jewish dispersions following these two invasions of Assyria and Babylon. And we see how they were spread out, some to the south into Egypt, many to the east into Mesopotamia and Persia. I, I should uh, say at this stage how grateful I am that we can use these particular slides. Uh, they come from two publications. I'm going to use a number from uh, Martin Gilbert, Jewish History Atlas and the Arab-Israeli Conflict. They are wonderful books. If you get a chance to get them, I recommend them highly. So just going back then to that table, the third entrance into the land was back from captivity under Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, and then another departure in AD 70 as prophesied by the Lord Jesus. And then they returned, and the nation was re-established in May 48. And they will depart again, according to Zechariah. And they will return again. And then they will depart no more, according to the promises to David. So what we have seen already, particularly 1948, cries out to us that the promises that are yet to be fulfilled will indeed be fulfilled. The Master will come. Israel will be saved and God's kingdom will be established. Now, one man who I believe understood this perfectly was Brother Thomas. He knew there had to be Jews back in the land before Jesus came, and he knew that there would be a further regathering following the return of the Master. How salvation comes to Israel then, according to Brother Thomas in Elpis Israel, he said, the truth is, there are two stages in the restoration of the Jews. The first is before the Battle of Armageddon, and the second after it, both are premillennial. 
He went on to say, there is then a partial and primary restoration of Jews before the manifestation, which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes after he has appeared in the kingdom. The pre-adventual colonization of Palestine will be on purely political principles and the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. They will emigrate thither as agriculturalists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth. He was absolutely right, wasn't he? Elpis Israel, written in 1849, the state reborn in 1948, because the word of God alone can make a man far-sighted in this age. What I believe Brother Thomas identified was the fact that there are prophecies here in the Word of God which relate to 1948 and prophecies which can only speak of that which is yet to come. The final regathering of Israel, the way to Jerusalem for them when they will be saved by their Messiah, their Prince, the one that they pierced. Can we look please at Zechariah chapter 13? I'm going to put the references up on the slide, brethren and sisters, but I find it far better to work from an open Bible, so I will give you plenty of time to find the references. Zechariah chapter 13, please, and verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And reading on in chapter 14, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth, and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. What do these nations do then, brethren and sisters? They don't come to Jerusalem to conquer. They come to Jerusalem, as we saw there in verse 2, to battle. The king of the north descends, the king of the south ascends, and they battle in and around Jerusalem. Because the power that reigns in God's city, will rule the world. Strategically, it is superb, of course, close to most of the major oil sources in the world. And having subdued Israel, Gog will be very popular amongst Israel's neighbours. But two-thirds, we see from chapter 13, verse 8, will die. Two-thirds will die. According to Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics, on May the 7th, 2003, Independence Day, the population of Israel was 6.7 million. Of those, 5.4 million were Jews. So just a, a simple calculation, we are talking well over 3 million Jews will die. We've said already that the history of Israel goes through cycles, it repeats. They have suffered so much before they will do so again. But before these events take place, Israel must dwell safely. Can we look please at Ezekiel 38? Now I will do my best not to tread on the toes of Brother Don too much, so we're not going into the, the nations that are listed here in Ezekiel 38. We just want to pick out the state of Israel at this time. How do they dwell? They dwell safely. Verse 8 of Ezekiel 38. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. 
we, we see firstly then, brethren and sisters, that when Israel dwells safely, they dwell safely in their land, having been gathered out of the nations. See the way that point is emphasised again and again in verse 8. Gathered out of many people, which have been always waste, brought forth out of the nations. So that terrible suffering that they went through, that horrendous persecution in so many lands, but especially Europe in the 1930s and the 1940s, from that terrible time came salvation, came a regathering back to their ancestors' homeland. The state of Israel was born in May 1948, reborn in accordance with Bible prophecy, and the subsequent return of Jews from so many different lands cries out to us, brethren and sisters, that Israel's God, our God, exists. Israel was gathered out of many people in accordance with Bible prophecy, brought forth out of the nations, to that place that always waste, according to one commentator, the land languished under the hand of the lazy Turk until the time came for God's people to inhabit it once again. How can we fail to see the hand of our God at work in these things? The position of Israel then, we've seen it already in verse 8, they will dwell safely. Verse 11 says the same thing. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. It's there in verse 14, which we'll look at in a moment. It's there in chapter 39. Again, Israel dwelling safely. Don't know whether anybody saw the news last night and that which took place in Tel Aviv. They don't, do they? They don't dwell safely. They don't dwell in a land without bars and gates. Israel has been putting up bars and gates, haven't they? This great security fence around the West Bank. Yet the word of God demands that at the time of the end this situation should change. Verse 14, please. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in the day when my people of Israel, here we have it again, dwelleth safely, shalt not thou know it. I want us to notice, please, the first use of this same word in the Old Testament, dwelling safely. Again, it relates to Jew and Gentile and conflicts. Genesis 34, 25, and it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, this is when the, the, the sons of Jacob arranged for the men of Shechem to be circumcised, The two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly, same word as safely in Ezekiel, and slew all the males. So whether this state of security, of comfort, is through peace deals for Israel, and let's be honest, how different things appear, or did appear, since Arafat died and was replaced by Mahmoud Abbas, or whether Israel simply attacks and defeats local enemies and therefore dwells victoriously in her land is not clear. What is clear is that they must dwell in peace before that time comes when the peace will finally be shattered. Verse 16. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O go before their eyes. So Israel will undeniably suffer, yet from that suffering will come an acceptance of the truth, an acknowledgement of their Messiah. And finally, they will love and worship him. Chapter 39, please, and verse 25. And here we have our fourth use of this phrase, dwelling safely. Verse 25, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, 
Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. The fourth use, then, of that phrase. So dwelling safely, they will then, they will then be saved. Verse 27. When I have brought them again, from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them into their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither, neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So there will be another captivity and through that captivity will come salvation israel will be chastened and brought again to their land in joy the way to jerusalem will be one of hardship yet joy and peace lies at the end of that path so that great time of joy when 200,000 worshipped at the western wall the first pilgrimage since the dispersion in 1967, remembered by a number in this room, I'm sure. This is nothing compared with that which is to come. For not just a small number of Jews will be gathered to God's city. All who survive will be saved and brought back to their land, back to the city of the great king. The clear Bible teaching, I say it once again, brethren and sisters, is that there will be a second regathering of Israel, 1948 being the first, after Jesus has returned. Ezekiel 34, please, just back a few pages. Ezekiel 34 and verse 12. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. What does that mean, brethren and sisters, the cloudy and dark day? Brother Michael mentioned clouds, didn't he, in the first address? Well, clearly this speaks of suffering. It speaks of a time of hardship for Israel. T speaks of the Gentile nations coming against them. Clouds, naturally, clouds are made up of water vapour drawn from the seas, which then sometimes falls upon the earth. And here clouds speak of that which comes from the seas of the nations. Many people descending upon the land, and many from Israel will suffer, yet that situation will be reversed. Verse 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. Is it David? Is it David's greater son? Probably, brethren and sisters, it's both. We know how those promises to David Demand him seeing his son reigning upon his throne. Here we have almost certainly Jesus and his great ancestor ruling over God's people. Now those clouds, those, those showers that were going to come to cause Israel to suffer, look at verse 26. And I will make them and all the places round about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. So a reversal of that terrible suffering which took place. Showers of blessing will come on Israel. And they will be saved. Verse 28. And they shall be no more a prey to the heathen. Neither shall the beast of the land devour them. But they shall dwell safely and none shall make them afraid. And here's that same phrase once again. Dwelling safely. Same in the English and in the Hebrew. Dwelling safely, but safely under the hand of, 
of their God and of his Son. It's there also in verse 25, dwelling safely in the wilderness. This second regathering is also spoken of in the Psalms. Can we look back, please, at Psalm 68? I, I say second, I know that we've seen that there have been a number of them, but in the context of the latter days, the first regathering is 1948, the establishment of the nation then, the second regathering is that which is yet to come, from which there will be no further dispersion. Verse 21 of Psalm 68. But God shall wound the head of his enemies. Genesis 3 all over again, isn't it? And the hairy scalp of such as one, and one as goeth on still in his trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. Twice in one verse, Israel will be brought again and established in their land perhaps looking back to Exodus and how they were literally brought from the sea. And here in the age to come, they will be brought from the seas of the nations, gathered from the world, brought back to their land where they will dwell. Isaiah 11, please. It's a beautiful kingdom prophecy. We quote it on a Sunday evening many times, and rightly so, the verses leading up to the section that we're going to look at, commencing in verse 10, speak unquestionably of the rule of the Lord Jesus. And therefore, verse 10, in that day shall there be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people to which shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. It has to be speaking of the kingdom, doesn't it? Look at verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, 1948 being the first, to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left. And now we have seven lands listed, from Assyria and from Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and then perhaps a further regathering of, of all those, no matter where they might be, from the islands of the sea. They'll be brought back. Now, what of these seven lands, brethren and sisters, listed there in verse 11? We notice, in fact, that they were all round about the nation of Israel. Assyria is mentioned. Well, the empire was so vast, it's hard to identify exactly where it's being spoken of. But Nineveh, the capital, is in modern-day Iraq. It's on the Tigris, opposite the modern-day city of Mosul. The next place was Egypt, and then Pathros, and Pathros is also in Egypt. The next was Cush. We're talking about modern-day Sudan and modern-day Ethiopia. The next was Elam, and Elam was right on the border of Iran and Iraq. The next was Shinar. We know, of course, from Scripture that Shinar is Babylon. So we're talking once again modern-day Iraq. The next was Hamath, modern-day Syria, and then the islands of the sea. Now, in many of these lands, brethren and sisters, there have been many Jews living throughout the ages, but not now. But not now. Almost all of the Jews in the majority of these lands have returned to Israel following the establishment of the nation in 1948. Their refugees sought sanctuary in Israel. They will once again seek sanctuary in that same place. And as we can see from these lands in North Africa and the Middle East, Jews have flocked back. You just imagine being a Jew in, shall we say, Libya in the days shortly after the battle for independence in 1948, when Israel should, by rights, have been driven into the sea and yet survived. And you've got to dwell amongst Libyans whose countrymen have gone and fought and died. Of course you're going to return. And that's what they did. Generally speaking, there are very few Jews dwelling in those lands now. 
And so the word of God demands there must be another captivity, brethren and sisters, another captivity for Israel, but that after that there will be a final liberation of those places by Jesus and the saints brought home as a nucleus of the nation in the kingdom. Chapter 60, please, of Isaiah. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Once again we say, this can only be a kingdom prophecy, can't it? It must be speaking of that which is to come. When Israel will shine because of the light that dwells therein. Only then can Gentile nations come and worship in God's city. Verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. Or they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Again, it's a regathering that is being spoken of, isn't it? I want us to pick up, please, one specific nation that is mentioned later in this chapter as playing a part in bringing back Israel. It's in verse 9. Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, and to the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. Now we haven't got time to consider Tarshish in detail, and once again that really would be treading on Brother Don's toes. But I feel strongly that Tarshish is the nation of Britain. We see here from verse 9 that there is no, no allies mentioned with Tarshish, no young lions there performing this duty, merely the ships of Tarshish first bringing their sons from far. How will they bring back the people of Israel? How will they accomplish that? Well, look at verse 8. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? It's incredibly poetic language, isn't it, brethren and sisters? It speaks of, of a power flying like a cloud, like doves. And then in that context... Surely the isles shall wait for me, the ships of Tarshish, first. Who are the ones that fly? Is it the saints, Isaiah 40, rising up with wings as eagles? Or is it Tarshish, bringing back God's people? This is just a suggestion for you. I may or may not be right. I know that Tarshish in Scripture is very much identified as a maritime power. Literally, ships will be used, but maybe... We're talking about aeroplanes here, bringing back, flying back to Israel that God's people might be saved and re-established in their homeland. Just a thought. Zephaniah, please, in chapter 3. Zephaniah 3 and verse 10 Again, as we read this chapter, we see that this is a, a kingdom prophecy. We've got the people speaking a pure language. We've got them serving God with one consent. And then verse 10, From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. A reversal then of that dispersion, a reversal of what we see now, where there are 14.1 million Jews in the world, over 5 million in the United States. Here we have the daughter of Israel being brought back. The daughter of my dispersed, established in the land. Notice it's the children who are spoken of. And what does that remind us of? But the Exodus, history repeating itself. But your little ones, which he said should be a prey, them will I bring in. And they shall know the land which ye have despised. And that, of course, is what took place. 
It was the second generation that entered and dwelt therein, and the children will be saved in the age to come. Verse 19, please, of the same chapter. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them a praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. Verse 20, at that time will I bring you again, even in that time will I gather you, for I'll make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth, when I turn back or bring again, revised version, your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Bringing them again. I want us to go back, please, to verse 19, and notice that phrase, her that halteth. Halteth. It's an unusual word in the Hebrew. It's only used on four occasions in the Old Testament. Once here, twice in Micah 4, which is also a, a kingdom prophecy. One other occasion. I'm sure that you could guess. It's the occasion when Jacob wrestled with the angel. He passed over Penuel. The sun rose upon him and he halted. Same word as in Zephaniah 3.19. He halted upon his thigh. Genesis 32, verse 31. What do we have, brethren and sisters? We have a reversal of the scattering. We have a reversal of Israel's faithlessness. And it's symbolised here in the reversal of the lameness of Jacob. Because now, Jacob can walk acceptably before his God. Zechariah, please. Chapter 8. We're going to look at a few passages in Zechariah now, try to deal with these um, sequentially in terms of the way that they appear in Scripture, because so many of these passages effectively say the same thing. Nonetheless, hopefully we are building up the picture of the way in which Israel will be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country, and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. It can only ever be a kingdom prophecy in its fullest sense, can't it? The previous verses speak of boys and girls playing in the streets, the old dwelling in the streets of Jerusalem, safely. Do we see that now? No, we do not. Nor can we until Christ comes. Notice please verse 21. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. So here we have Exactly the same picture that we saw in chapter 14, with strong nations descending upon Jerusalem, but they descend to lay down their weapons before Israel's God. They descend to worship there, to honour him, to acknowledge him. Verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Taking hold of the skirt perhaps reminds us of the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew 9, who, if only she could but just touch the garments of the Lord Jesus, would be made whole. And she was. And notice how they say, we will go with you. So Israel is going, and the Jews tag along. Sorry, the Gentiles tag along. Out of the Gentile world, desirous to receive the protection that Yahweh offers. And again, it's a repetition of the Exodus, isn't it? A mixed multitude went up, we're told, in Exodus 12:38. Now, as an aside, brethren and sisters, notice there in verse 23, ten men take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. Ten men. Why ten men? Why not 
a hundred? Why not a thousand? Why ten men? Well, these ten men represent all humanity, don't they? All who are in need of what our Heavenly Father has to offer. Because they will come to the one from Israel who will provide for them, who will comfort them, who will bless them, who will heal them. Sound familiar? Luke 17 and verse 12. And as Jesus entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. Ten men. All in need of salvation. All in need of cleansing. Jesus Christ provided, didn't he? And they were all blessed through him, even though only one was truly made whole. Only one gave God the glory. Nonetheless, they all received the blessing. And in the age to come, those ten men in figure will come to Jerusalem once again and bow down before that same man, the Son of God. Chapter 10, please, of Zechariah and verse 3. Mine anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I punish the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock in the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Out of him came forth, and here we have four descriptions of the Lord Jesus Christ. The corner, the nail, the battle bow, every oppressor together. There's Jesus Christ. He is indeed the corner. He's the chief cornerstone, isn't he? And as a corner, naturally, is a place where two walls meet. Jew and Gentile meet in him, for he is the saviour of them all. He is the nail. He is fixed. He is sure. He is supportive. You, you knock a nail into a wall, it's there. Unless you're like I am at DIY, but you know what I mean. It's there, and there it stays. The same symbols used in Isaiah 22. He's the battle bow. He will wage war with the enemies of Israel and he will win. He's every oppressor together because he will oppress the enemies of God. Now that word oppressor is very interesting. The Hebrew literally means to drive or by implication to tax or to harass or to tyrannize. Amazing to think of the Lord Jesus Christ as an oppressor in that way. In fact, it's the same word that's used in Exodus 3 and Exodus 5 of the taskmasters in Egypt. And it's the same word that's used elsewhere of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, we read he was oppressed. It's exactly the same word as oppressor in Zechariah 10 verse 4. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. In other words, brethren and sisters, others were the oppressors of Jesus Christ. He will be their oppressors when he returns. And he will save Israel as he does. Verse 6. And I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them again to place them for I'll have mercy upon them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am the Lord their God and will heal them. Brought again from many lands. The same is there in verse 9 and verse 10. I will sow them among the people. And they shall remember me in far countries. And they shall live with their children and turn again. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt. And gather them out of Assyria. I will bring them again into the land of Gilead and Lebanon. And place shall not be found for them. Just as an aside, going back to verse 6 there, why do you think that speaks of Judah and Joseph? Judah's going to be strengthened, Joseph's going to be saved. Why the difference? Well, maybe Judah is within the land and Joseph is outside. We read, in fact, in Genesis 49, the blessings of Jacob, speaking of Joseph, of him that was separate from his brethren. 
So having been gathered out of the world, they are then brought, aren't they? Brought into the land once again. Gathered from Egypt, gathered from Assyria, so southwest and northeast, and they are brought into the land to Gilead and Lebanon. Brought to acknowledge their Messiah. Chapter 12, please, and verse 10. We, we couldn't not turn to this section of scripture today, could we? Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The Jews are going to mourn when they behold the master, the one whom they pierced. They're going to mourn as a parent mourns. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now I know that we often suggest that should be him whom they have pierced, as indeed later in the chapter and continuing Zechariah, that is the way that's used. Yet others were pierced when Jesus Christ suffered. His mother Mary, Simeon said, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. And as the hands and the side of Jesus Christ were pierced, her soul was pierced in sorrow. Chapter 13, please, of Zechariah. Verse 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. In that day. There's a phrase that we read again and again, isn't it, towards the end of Zechariah. In that day. So having been preserved and having been enlightened and having been brought back, Israel will dwell in peace and they will be cleansed baptised into Jesus Christ, their Saviour, baptised into him. I believe strongly that there will be adult baptism in the age to come. This is one just, just one such passage that supports this. We must begin to bring our thoughts to a close. Can we turn back, please, to the passage that we read a few moments ago? So Jeremiah, we're going to go in, in fact, in the, the previous chapter, Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The time of Jacob's trouble, literally anguish. That's how Rotherham's literal translation renders that expression. That's what it means. The time of Jacob's trouble. It's a strange expression, isn't it, brethren and sisters? It's a little bit like us saying, for example, the day it rained last summer. You know, which one of all the days? The time of Jacob's trouble. Which time? Jacob has always been in trouble. Israel have suffered again and again. Sometimes problems of their own making, sometimes simply through others who, as David said in Psalm 69, hated me without a cause. Yet wherever they have been, whoever they have lived amongst, there's been anguish. Invariably they have been saved, or a remnant has been saved. And that trouble, that evil, will come to an end. All Israel shall be saved. At last, natural Israel will dwell in the land that the patriarchs were promised so many years before, and they will dwell there in peace. Chapter 31, please, in verse 1. We see from the previous chapter and the final verse that this is a prophecy of the latter days. This is a prophecy which we should anticipate the fulfilment of. Chapter 31, verse 1. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Verse 9 of the same chapter. 
chapter 31 and verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them and will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. A straight way. Still waters, rivers of waters. There we have Psalm 23. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And again, Mark 1, verse 3. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Verse 10, please, of the same chapter. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar of off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him, as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. It's happened again and again, hasn't it? There we have one such example, how Israel was surrounded in 1948. Six Gentile nations, far better equipped, far more soldiers. And this brand new nation, which should not have survived, survived, ransomed from the hand of stronger enemies. How much, brethren and sisters, do we long for that day? How much do we pray for that time? How much do we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And how much are we watching the signs? And how much do we respond to that which we see? You see, it's one thing to know the truth, brethren and sisters, one thing to know the truth it's another thing to live it it's one thing to see the signs it's another thing to respond to those signs you see the scribes and pharisees knew their old testament scriptures perfectly yet very few lived lives as a heavenly father required of them and what about us we watch the signs how much are we affected by that which we see? Can we turn, please, to Matthew 16? And here we have the only use of this phrase, the signs of the times, in Scripture. The only use of this phrase, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ who uses this expression. We know the context well, verse 1. The Pharisees, also with the Sadducees, came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Jesus says, well, you can discern the face of the sky, end of verse 3, but can you not discern the signs of the times? You can see the things of the world round about, but you can't see the things of the truth. And they come and say, show us a sign, show us a sign. They had seen countless signs, hadn't they? Again and again. They'd seen the sick healed. They'd seen multitudes fed. They'd seen the dead raised. They'd heard the word of God preached. And still they said, show us a sign. And yet this request, brethren and sisters, is even more astounding, bearing in mind where they were. Where were they at this time? Well, we need to go back to the last verse of the previous chapter to answer that question. Verse 39 of Matthew 15. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coasts of Magdala. And that's where the scribes and the Pharisees come and the Sadducees and say, show us a sign. Here in Magdala, show us a sign now. And there's only one person in Scripture who's actually identified as coming from Magdala, and that is, of course, Mary of Magdala. Mary Magdalene. There we have it up there in Galilee, not very far from Cana, just northeast of Nazareth, and again, not too far from Capernaum and Bethsaida on the north coast of Galilee. Magdala was on the west. Now, only Luke's gospel record tells us about Mary's healing. It's in Luke chapter 8, which we won't turn to because of time. But we're told there that she was healed of seven devils. And 
Whatever that means, brothers and sisters, there's nobody else in Scripture that we read that of. So whatever her suffering was, it was more intense than that of others. Now when we compare Matthew and Luke, in Luke chapter 8, the healing of Mary is followed by the parable of the sower. And that appears in Matthew 13. So what I'm suggesting to you is this. Prior to this point where Jesus comes to Magdala and they say to him, show us a sign, Mary was already healed. In fact, probably she was following Jesus Christ because we know that the women did. Show us a sign. And Jesus Christ could have said, just open your eyes. Here is this woman. Here's this, this mad woman that you all knew that perhaps you all used to shun and mock. She's in her right mind. She's whole. She's following me. She knows the truth. Open your eyes, Jesus Christ could have said. The signs are there. Signs that demand a response from you if only you will hearken to the words. And the signs of the times, brethren and sisters, abound for us as well, don't they? If only we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Signs that speak to us of the Master's coming. Signs that cry out to us of his nearness. Signs that prove to us the clear Bible truth that through much tribulation, Israel finally will be saved by her King. 